Please, please see her if you would, and uh, we, we would like for all of you to go. All right. You know, yeah, you know who you are. But I want you to go anyway, so you can sit by me. So, <clears throat> the Thanksgiving covered dish service is Sunday, November twenty fourth at five p.m. We're starting there. Um, the Vision Center is joining us, and um, we're delighted to be joining us also. 
And this is what I want to ask you as a church. Two things I want to really pour out to you today and beg of you and plead with you today to let's be the church that God's called us to be. We've reached out so many times to other churches, and predominantly black churches, because we wanted to do things with them. We wanted to do something together so that we could show the world that we're together, that we're one. And you know what? We're never going to bring the world together. We're never going to bring people together and be one and celebrate together here until the leaders start doing it. You know? And so we've, we started that. God's opened the door with the relationship between Word Alive and us and opened the door with the relationship between the Vision Center and us. And, and Pastor Terry Dunnis came here and spoke that Monday night if you were here. And so they're having a conference starting next Thursday. It's just Thursday and Friday night at 7 o'clock called Purge. And their, their, um, their overseer or prophet, whatever you want to call her, um, whatever the title is, titles don't make a difference to me. I mean, salvation makes a difference. But so, I mean, some people get hung up on titles, I did too. But at the same time, you know, uh, I heard that lady preach one day before, and she's powerful. She's got an anointing of God on her. And so she's going to be speaking. Our praise band's going to be playing that Thursday night. They, he caught text me this week, and I thought, man, that's so cool. Thank you to our praise band for stepping up and being willing to do that. Uh, actually, Friday night, Shannon's going to be on her own by herself with you. And so, that, you know, you know when you plan something, you have everything in stone, and then all of a sudden something backs out, how, how stressful it is? And so when he texted me and said, hey, our musicians backed out. I'm not gonna, we're not going to be happy. Is your praise band available at all? And so I just called them and asked them and everything too, and they're so willing. I'm thankful for that. But I'm asking you as a church to let's go show our, our approval there. I'll tell you right now as your pastor, I won't be there Friday night. I would love for us to have more there Friday night than, than, than Thursday night because my son has an opening night for his play on Friday night in Oklahoma. I'm not going to miss that. But we'll be there Thursday night for sure. And I just want to show them, hey, we, we're the real, you know, we don't want to invite them. They come to us every time and all, but we not do anything in return. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like if we're going to do things, we're going to grow together, we need to reach out to them too. So if you want to go that Thursday night and you don't have a ride or anything, see me. I'll come get you, whatever we need to do. Um, but I, I'd love for you to be there. It's, you can't miss it. If you know where Elm City is, you get off the Elm City exit. Go down 301, get off the Elm City exit, the one that has the bridge, turn right. You go down, when you see the railroad track right in front of you, you look to the left, it's right down the corner, it says TBC, the vision center. And Seth thought it was the eye, eye care center, so you never know. Um, next is, uh, is the youth dinner theater. will be uh, Sunday, December the 8th at 5 p.m. And the show starts at 6 p.m., 6.30. The cost is $10, $5 for 10 and under, ages 10 and under. So the youth will be selling tickets. Okay, please buy your tickets. And I actually, I know so many times I've said, when John was here, I told him, I told Chris, we've talked about it many times as leaders, our church is, is famous, okay, famous for waiting to the last minute. Okay, we put a sign-up sheet up, everybody, and all of a sudden, the last minute, people go in there and put it up. We want to be prepared for it, okay? So we want to be prepared for the dinner and all those things, too, so that we don't waste funds that you could have that they're raising. So please, buy a ticket from them, okay? Even if you're not coming, buy a ticket and give it to somebody. You can't be here, buy a ticket and give it to somebody. Okay, I promise you $10 ain't broke the bank, and I don't think it'll break any of us in here. Okay? We, we probably wasted that. If you buy a drink nowadays, it's what, $3? <laughs> it's crazy, right? And, we, and, and sometimes that's water. Where we used to just get it out of the tap. How many of y'all remember where we didn't have bottled water? <laughs> yeah. Man, no teenagers raised their hand at all. <laughs> it's y'all's generation. <laughs> but also, too, don't forget about church cups and all those things, too. But uh, I wanted to let you know this morning. The other thing I want to plead with you as a church, so many times when we have something going on in our life, people reach out to us in church. And I'm not being ugly, I'm just being honest. There's times when other people have things going on and when we reach out to people and people reach out to us, we don't return that. Miss Carol Kelly died yesterday. That's Jessica died to And I'm sitting there as a pastor with my son at his competition and I'm, I get a text from Jessica that says, they're doing CPR with my grandma right now. Will you pray? Chris and I stopped and prayed for her right then. And then we'd run out and get set some lunch and come right back. And, and I called one of the guys at the fire department I knew because we actually got the call on our fire department. I went in and looked and saw Ms. Wanda's name was the caller on, there, on the Act 911. And then next thing you know, um, I called one of the guys and he told me that she didn't make it. Um, her daughters walked in together, thank God, and found her laying on the bed. And so um, they don't know how long she'd been there or anything. But she was in our church with Sunday before last. And a uh, sweet, sweet, wonderful lady. And I don't know any details of the funeral, but I'm asking you as a church, if you eat, take some food over those things, please. please. I don't know any other family they really have any either. I know it's just Jessica and her mom and her aunt. That was in her grandma. That's all I know. And her grandma and her two aunts moved in together. If you know where Oak Level Cafe is, it's easy for you to find their house. Okay? It's just right beside Oak Level Cafe, a little brick house right here on the corner. You can't miss it. If nothing else and you go there and they're not home, leave a note and tell them to call you. Let's, let's bombard that family with love. Really, 
This is a time where we as a church can say, hey, we want to be there for you. We want to be there for you. This is one of ours, you know? Also, too, I was notified this morning that um, when we find out the service times and everything, too, for that, I'll let you know, but I'm not sure what's going to go on yet and how it's going to happen. It just happened. So be, please be in prayer for them. Of course, Jessica was tore up, and, and be in prayer for her a lot, you know? Sometimes when things happen like that, you blame yourself for things and all. She asked her grandma to go to the doctor Saturday. And she said she made an appointment for Sunday, and she felt like if she had got her grandma to the ER, it would be different, you know? And so she's kind of beating herself up a little bit. So please be in prayer for her, too. And I will say publicly, I am proud that I married them. When I text yesterday, when I cut text her yesterday, I said, well, I called her, and I said, is Matthew with you? And she said, yes. And I said, damn, damn, thank God. You know, because that boy works his hind end off all the time. And I was thinking, okay, he's out there on a bulldozer somewhere. He ain't going to be there with her and everything. And I was already in the, in the mode of getting ready to call and say, hey, boy, you just got married. Go home and do what you want. He was already there, you know. Thank God for godly men. Amen. Thank God for godly men who say, hey, it doesn't matter about them with the Clinton concert. I'm going to be here with you, baby. Okay. So we're good. Also, too, um, this Cat Davis. I was notified earlier this Cat Davis that used to be in our church. And she moved, I guess, three years ago. To, to 2018, it's been over a year, enough. and she moved to Tennessee with her family, and uh, she passed away. They contacted us this week and said something about it maybe two weeks or so, is that what they said? So evidently it was earlier, I don't know when she passed, but the funeral was tomorrow at 12 p.m. At, jo at Johnson Funeral Home in Rocky Mount. That's right there off the exit where the hospital is, and you go around that little curve there by the, by the shiny diner. And the, the uh, funeral is at 12, and the visitation will be prior to the funeral, and so we wanted to let you know about that, so be in prayer for that family also. Uh, she was in decline health, I think, when she left here anyway. So, um, but be in prayer for her if you would, too, and, and be in prayer for her family if you would. Okay? Um, at this time, I want to share something with you. If you would, if you're visiting with us, text that, please. If you would, if you haven't done it as a church member, please text it. If you've done it 25 times, and you're not by yourself, the one, two seats in front of you did it too, baby. So, you know, y'all in the group. When two or more gather, you know, he's in the midst. So, all right. And, and look, we'll call and try to find out what's going on and everything, too. And I was ready to just cancel that thing, no joke. And all of a sudden, they said, we check. And I'm going to tell you something. This is what's really cool about that, that we use Pastor's Line. They can actually go in and see if they call their carrier and find out if that message was sent and if, you, if your carrier received it and delivered it. I was like, oh, I didn't realize I could do all that. And so they say, you know, we had two had the numbers blocked of church. And uh, I knew that because Sam, I only reason I knew it was because Sam had his block one time and I was trying to call him from church and it wouldn't go, it kept going to me. And I said, I texted him, I said, dude, my phone doesn't work in my office. I said, call me. So he called me, I said, why couldn't I call you? He said, oh, I got a church number. I don't know why you couldn't call me. Then we realized later he had the church number blocked because the hours would come when he was in school, so they turned it off and they blocked it. So if you've done that with your phone and you're not getting messages from us, that's why. So go in and check, and it's easy. Slide down if you got an iPhone and just search block. That's all you got to do. And you can come up and tell you who you got blocked and you can unblock it. Okay? And it works after being blocked, it doesn't blink. <laughs> so at this time though, I want to share with you a video. Oh yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nick, whoever did that. Birthdays, anniversaries? We got a birthday today. Hey, come here, brother. Come here, man. Come here, man. Birthday. Is your birthday? Last Wednesday, that's right. And then Will's the next, that's right. Hey Will, she's older, right? She is. Yeah, got your food right here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you birthday? Birthday? Last Monday? That's right. I, I'm telling you something. I mean, I know I talked to you and told you I had a birthday. But I, I didn't remember this week. So, um, but this little young guy, come here, bud. We're going to sing to everybody. Come here, man. Today, actually, today is his birthday. Okay, today is his birthday. So, yeah, can we sing? I'll say, let's sing happy birthday to him. I'm, I'm not going to leave it, okay? about that soon. Um, I, I do want to let you know that, that if you'd like to do this, what she's going to tell you, I, I highly, honestly, I don't endorse a whole lot of things, but I highly endorse this group that she's going to show you and that you're getting ready to see. And they are wonderful, but they're awesome and their messages come. I'll share with the kids on the van this morning on the way here a couple of other, other, other videos. You can go on YouTube and watch them soon and see. 
But these guys are awesome. Their heart is in it. I met them in person, talked to them. I've seen them several times live, and they're really awesome. So if you would watch this. This morning. Hi, teacher. Hi. 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 I, Hi. I, I'm your substitute teacher. Yeah. My name is Mr. Drummond. What you talking about? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what I'm going to talk about. Uh -huh. um, what's, what's your name? My name's Billy, like the goat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I'm not really a goat. No, you're a little boy. I'm just a kid. You're a little boy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to talk about Grace, okay? That's... Oh, I know Grace. Oh, you know Grace. I know all about Grace. Okay, well, then this should be. She's in my other class. No. No. She's pretty. Okay. No. She makes me feel funny. Okay, okay. No. Okay, all right. This, this, this is a different type of grace. Oh, it's another girl named Grace? No, no. It's a, it's a concept that I will teach you through a song about a guy named Zacchaeus. Oh, Zacharias. No, it's Zacchaeus. Zucchini. It's Zacchaeus. So I'll let it's you. Zacchaeus. Zaboom, my food. Okay, 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 okay. Hey, hey, I need zoom, you. Zoom. Hey, listen. Don't touch. Okay, okay, sorry, sorry, okay. Sorry, I need you just to listen, okay? okay. I'm going to teach you about a guy named uh, Zacchaeus through this song, okay? Oh, I love to sing. Okay, well then... Well, I love to sing uh, songs to God. Uh, okay. Like, I love to sing, I love to sing, mm. Jesus loves me, uh, this I know, uh, for the Bible done told me so. Mm. I'm going to be the next American Idol. <laughs> sure you are. Sure you are. Sure you are. What is this? What is this? Oh, the Bible told me so. Uh -huh. Like you're sewing. Mm. My grandmother sews memory verses in my underwear. Mm. Mm. In case I have an accident. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> and I bet a little kid like you, you probably do have accidents, right? I just did. All right, thanks. Here we go, here we go. Kids, class, here we go with the story. Here we go with the song. Here we go, okay? It goes like this. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. <laughs> Zacchaeus was a wee little man. <laughs> what, 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 Billy? B Billy, Billy, Billy. Don't touch. <laughs> Stranger danger. <laughs> You're supposed to sign a form. <laughs> okay, 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 I did, I did, it's okay. Okay, um, okay, um, wh why are you laughing? Why are you laughing? Why are you laughing? Because you said we. Uh, we, we mean small. You mean something else too. Okay. okay, hey, hey, I really need you to... Don't touch. Okay, sorry, okay, okay, li okay, okay. I need you to listen, okay? It goes like okay. this, okay, okay. Zacchaeus was a wee little man... And a wee little man was he, he climbed. <laughs> what, what is so funny? What is so funny? You said we. Yes. And then you said we again. You said we, we. I can't wait to tell my mom about the song you taught us in Sunday school. <laughs> Okay, 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 okay. Zacchaeus was a short guy. What? He was a short guy. What's wrong with short people? Nothing. Nothing is wrong with short people. I'm just trying to get through the song, okay? And a short guy was he. He climbed up the sycamore tree for the... He climbed up the sycamore... Well, okay, B Billy. Billy. Billy, 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 Bill, what, Billy, what, what is the matter? What is the matter? What is the matter? What's wrong with the tree? There's nothing wrong with the tree. You said it was sick. I did not. Yes, you did. I did not. Yes, you no, did. I did not. Yes, you no, I did not. No, I said it was a sycamore tree. Oh, it's getting sicker by the minute. Okay, okay. Why are you teaching children about dying trees? You're the sick one. Don't, 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 don't touch. I didn't sign a paper.
He he climbed up. He climbed up an oak an oak tree. A what? He climbed up an oak tree. Oh, an oak tree. Yes. So it's oak K. There you go. There you go. <laughs> he climbed up an oak tree. Well, who wouldn't? For the Lord, he wanted to see. Oh, is this where Jesus comes? Yes, this is the part in the song where Jesus is no, coming. No, no, no. Jesus can't come because I don't have on my bow tie. Oh, you you know what, class? Let's just let's just slow down real quick, okay, class? This is a great great opportunity. You see, Billy, um, um, you don't have to wear a bow tie, okay? Because Jesus takes you just as you are, okay? All right. <laughs> and as the Savior passed His way, <laughs> what what did I? What what did I? What 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 did, what did I what did I do? What did I do? What did I do? Jesus is gonna take me. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm too young to die. He says not. If I knew my life was gonna be so short, I would have lived differently. He's not. Don't touch me. Okay, okay. He he's he's not gonna take you. He's not gonna take you. He's not gonna take me today. Unfortunately, no. All right. Okay. Just, just let me get through the song. You are not good with children. <laughs> and as the Savior passed his way, he's still coming. He's here. Jesus should get a scooter. Okay, okay, okay. You see, this is the part where Jesus is going to see Zacchaeus in the tree, and he's going to show crazy love, grace, undeserved favor to Zacchaeus because nobody likes Zacchaeus. Oh, Zacchaeus was like you. I need you. Don't touch. <laughs> and as the Savior passed his way, he looked up in that tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you quit wee weeing on trees, you're killing them. The skit guys, um, the Wilson or Pregnancy Center or the Choices Women's Center now they call themselves is hosting the skit guys at East Church. Next Friday night, the 7th, no, sorry, the 8th, at 7 o'clock. So I have tickets, they're $10 over there in, in donations from churches. And so if you can come out and support this, I think it's an awesome ministry. Also, dinner theater, parents, it's going to be different this year. I used to, well, whoever I used pastor with in the past, they would send tickets home with the kids. But many times you didn't see those tickets. So here's what we're doing this, this year. I am assigning Sunday mornings. Before the service and after the service for the kids to set up in the front and the back to sell tickets, okay? So you don't have to take them home. If you want a ticket and nobody asks you, which they did pretty well covering the area today. But if you want a ticket, all you have to do is come see me or see one of the youth and we can get you a ticket. It's, as Todd already said, $10 for adults, $5 for 10 and under. And if your child is in the show, you do not have to pay, okay? Next thing. Fall Festival is today. Yay! We need everyone. This is a huge, huge evangelism opportunity. We have so many people in the community that we don't go knock on doors because a lot of people don't like, like you going to their doors, but they're coming to us. Today they're coming to us and we have the opportunity to share the love of God to everyone that steps on this property. You know, we need to pray up over this place so that they can just feel God's presence when they step on this um, this property. So today, I need everybody to sign up. We have a place for you. You say, I don't like to talk to people. That's okay. You can stuff hamburger buns. You know, we have a place for everybody. So we need everybody to come. Set up at 2 o'clock today. All right? You got something? And, and we're not doing the tent evangelism event this afternoon because we have to take the kids to lunch when we leave here. Because there's no need to take them home, take everybody home and turn around and come back and all that stuff. So we're taking youth to lunch. And we're going to actually be doing evangelism this evening too. So we have an opportunity to do that. But we will do the tent evangelism over here at the stoplight the next time when we don't, it's not so much in together too. So that was on me. It was my fault. I announced we're going to do it and everything. And then, I, then Chris and I talked and I was like, man, that kind of is pushing time to everything, get people back and get set up and all. So that's on me. Okay? All right. So I have tickets for... Friday, November 8th, if you would like to have a ticket, okay? And I need to go ahead and get rid of them so I can turn the money in. All right, ushers, if you'll come forward.
got a hand clap. He's good. He is good. Amen. The children will be dismissed at this time to go out with the teachers for Children's Church. And for those of us that don't teach Children's Church, let's give our children's workers a hand too. Amen. This morning I wanted to, I was, uh, I told uh, Nick the other week, I was really excited, really excited about this week, really excited about where we'd be in, in First Kings, really, really excited about what, what was happening and what God did and what God, we, we think that God's not still doing it, but he is still doing it, amen? Amen? amen. We're going to go light, okay? So we're not sleeping, all right? We don't want you. We don't want to sit and move. We want to sit and move for worship like that, but not for the word. Amen. And so this morning, I want to share with you. I titled this: "How hot is your wood? How hot is your wood?" Okay. And and uh, you can go wherever you want to with that. But we'll, you, I hope in the end you'll know where we're going with it. Okay. And I, a guy gave me that title. I was like, okay. I was sitting there. And I was like, all right. Is this really it? And uh, then you know, sometimes you, you question like, okay, people can take this the wrong way and go with it. So I text my wife. And ask her, then I text Nick and ask him, I was like, hey, what do you think about this title? Because he always puts it in the PowerPoint and stuff and everything. So, I mean, Linda puts in PowerPoint, but he always goes in and does it on YouTube on our live feed. He does that and puts all the stuff in there and everything, so he likes to have the title. And I, I do remember that I think Pastor Jonathan was here one time and spoke, and he said something about your wood being wet, okay? All right? So we don't want our wood to be wet. We want our wood to be hot. Amen? And I hope you have that when you get finished today. God is awesome. He is, man. I was telling Crystal this week, just to look and see what he's done in our lives and go back. And sometimes I don't even think about it. And I'm thankful when I praise him for it because he comes full circle so many times if we'll just sit back and watch and listen and wait. You know, and, and uh, I, I do praise God. I testify today of that. That, you know, I told Crystal I was sitting in the tree stand on Friday evening and I was like, man, I was just talking to God. Me and him just talking. And, and I was like, man, it was just a peaceful, easy time. And, and next thing you know, I texted him and I said, let me tell you what God just, God just reminded me. That when I came to this church, to be the pastor, you weren't working. You didn't have to work. I mean, I worked three jobs, I had enough money, you stay home. And then all of a sudden, you had to go back to work because God called me to full-time ministry. And you had to leave our little girl, and you would stay with her every day, and you had to do that. But then, you know what, Crystal? About five years ago or so, God opened up a door for you to stay home again with your little girl. And then God opened up an opportunity for you to go back to work doing something that you feel called to do in ministry. And how he set it up over this whole time in her life, and she was able to share with me later when I got home, how he prepared her for this, this whole time of what she was going through. But what God really revealed to me was, hey, you know what? When I was mad when we came here because she had to go back to work, not mad, I just felt like as a man, man, I don't want her to have to change her whole lifestyle and all that stuff and everything. I mean, she was with my little girl, you know? And I was like, but God, I did it because that's what you told me to do. That's what you called us to do. And that's what we had to do. But God, you are a full circle man. You come back around because she didn't have to. And now she's not going to work because she has to go to work. She's going to work because God's called her to a place to minister to young ladies and everything, too, who are making a decision about life or death. And you know what? That's, that's amazing to me to see how God's come full circle in that thing. And just to watch what God's done. And I want to tell you, you know, learn from me. Learn from my mistakes. Don't be upset and everything with him because you know what? Ten and a half years later, almost 11 years later, he's come full circle again. And it took 11 years for me to realize that. For me to realize that. Okay, so I want you to learn from mine. Realize when he starts doing something, he's doing something for a reason, just like he is today in the scripture. <clears throat> in 1 Kings chapter 18, beginning at verse 20, you can read on the screen there with me, or your phones, your iPad, your, your Bible in front of you, in the pew, whatever you want to do. So Ahab summoned all the people of Israel and the prophets to Mount Carmel. Then Elijah stood in front of them and said, How much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? You can take, I promise you, this, this scripture we read today, you can take about 25 or 30 sermons out of that. Yeah, I can stop right there and say, Hey, you know what? Why are we wobbling between two things? Why are we, why are we not sure? That's us, too. We're just saying, What? You know, we, we live everyday life and things come in our way and we handle it where we were not supposed to and not the way God called us to. I, I'm just like you. We're all the same and human. Some things we handle situations like we wanted to handle them, and then later on they find out it didn't work out the way because we didn't even seek God out of it. Right? We're wavering between. This is where they are. How much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people, and I thought, how bold is that, man? He steps up and he was like, hey, if you're false God that you think is God, 
is really God, then follow Him. But if my God, who is really God, then you follow Him. But make a decision to do something. Don't just sit there. Don't wait. Make a decision to follow something. Make, sure, make a decision to believe in something. When people tell me all the time, oh, that person's atheist. When I ask them, well, how'd you get here? Uh, uh, well, if you believe in Big Bang Theory, something had to happen, okay? There had to be a great... You just didn't appear, okay? And those that, are, that think we evolved from apes, we still have apes. Why? They haven't evolved yet? That's my question for them. Why is that? Why do we still have apes? Have they not evolved yet? So you're going to go to the zoo one day and all of a sudden they're going to evolve into a man right there in front of them. Doubt it. Doubt it. Our God created us and in His image. Amen? But the people were completely silent. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only prophet of the Lord who is left. And I want to point out something to you there, okay? He's not saying I'm the only prophet in all the world. He's saying I'm the only prophet that's here that's left to do what God's called me to do. See, he's got a, he's got a purpose. And Elijah realized it. I'm the only prophet of the real God of the Lord who is left here right now to face this situation, face this battle by himself. But Baal has 450 prophets. Now bring two bulls. The prophets of Baal may choose whichever one they wish and cut it into pieces and lay it on the wood of their altar, but without setting it on fire, or set, without setting fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood on the altar, but not set it, so it's not set fire to it. Then call on the name of your God. I love it, little G. And I will call on the name of the Lord. All caps. The God who answers by setting fire to the wood is the true God. See, I want to show you something. Do you see what he did there? Is the true what? Big G, right? He already knew. I submit to you this one nonsense. He already knew. When I was studying this out, I was like, dang, man, how did I miss that all these times I read it? How did I miss that time? He said to them, hey, you bring your God, you bring your call, whoever, but you know what? When the wood set on fire, then that'll be the one true God. Big G. He already knew his God was going to be it. He already knew. And all the people agreed, man, that must be something. They must not have been a Baptist church, right? Or Methodist church or Episcopal church when they all vote. Nobody agrees on everything, right? Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, you go first, for there are many of you. Choose one of the bulls and prepare it and call on the name of your God, but do not set fire to the wood. So they prepared one of the bulls and placed it on the altar. They cut, then they called on the name of Baal, from morning until noontime, shouting. I find that so crazy, man. We can't even come to church and pray for 30 minutes. A whole 30 minutes, pray solidly for 30 minutes. But man, they were calling out all day long, half the day away, right? From morning to noontime, shouting, Oh, Bill, answer us! But there was no reply of any kind. Then they danced, hobbling around the altar that they made. About noontime, Elijah began mocking them. I love it, man. This is my favorite part of the whole scripture. You'll have to shout louder, Scott, for surely he's a god. Perhaps he's daydreaming or relieving himself. He went off to the woods to take a peek. Maybe that's where he's at. That's what relieving yourself means. Go study it. It's there. Maybe he's relieving himself. Maybe he went to the bathroom. Maybe he just dashed off and he hit me right back. Maybe there was a line. You know? Crazy. Or maybe he is away on a trip or is asleep and needs to be waking. I thank God our God is not asleep. Amen. He never sleeps. So they shouted louder. And following their normal custom, they cut themselves with knives and swords until the blood gushed out. What's that represent in, in the Old Testament days when they did that? Huh? What's that represent? Now, the blood is a sacrifice, but here's the thing. Why would they cut themselves? Why did they tear their clothes? Why did they tear their burlap? Why? Mourning. They were mourning. They were mourning. Remember that. They raved all afternoon until the time of the evening sacrifice, but still there was no sound, no reply, no response. Michael, are you listening, man? I'm not quite calling him out to embarrass him, but you'll see in a minute. Then Elijah called to the people, come over here. They all crowded around him as he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. He took 12 stones, one to represent each of the tribes of Israel, and he used the stones to rebuild the altar in the name of the Lord. Then he dug a trench around the altar large enough to hold about three gallons. He piled wood on the altar, cut the bull into pieces, and laid the pieces of the wood. Laid, laid, laid the pieces on the wood. Then he said, fill four large jars with water and pour the water over the offering. Wait, it's still coming again. Pour the water over 
the offering up and the wood. After they had done this, he said, do the same thing again. And then, and when they were finished, he said, now do it a third time. So they did as he said, and the water ran around the altar and even filled the trench. At the usual time for offering the evening sacrifice, Elijah, the prophet said, he knew what time they were supposed to offer. He knew, so he didn't just do it in the morning, just go out and do it and call somebody. He knew. He was already ready. Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. Oh Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you. Look at it. Man, he's not just saying, hey God, come. He's saying, God, I want people to know who you are. I want people to recognize you. I want people to know you and see what you're doing. That's my purpose in this. Not to show off. Not to just mock them. But so that people know who you are. Because I know who you are. Answer me. So these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God, and that you have brought them back to yourself. Immediately, the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. Let me tell you why it's important. Okay? I told you I look for confirmation all the time. Mike, can you tell them what you told me Wednesday night when we were riding on the van on the way to church? And we passed by a big, huge pile of, of, of wood sitting out there that had been cut and logged. Can you tell me what you said? I said, uh, instead of just watering all the way around, they dig a trench to put water around it so the fire doesn't spread. Go, Daddy. Go, Daddy. And I told him Wednesday, I got the chicken skin. I looked at him Wednesday night and I said, hey, remember you said that. Remember Sunday that you said that. Thank you for confirmation. Thank you for allowing the Lord to, lose, to, to lead you and use you in this situation. You don't think that's confirmation? That out of the blue, all of a sudden, we just happened to pass by a pile of, of, of wood out there piled up where they logged it and everything. He said, they didn't burn that. And, of course, my said, oh, there's green out there. Don't burn the green. He said, no, I'm talking about the pile of wood over there. All you do is just dig a trench all around and put some water in and everything's safe from going in there. And I was like, are you serious? Go, God. He's good. Amen? It even licked up all the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and cried out, the Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord is God. Then Elijah commanded, seize all the prophets of Baal, don't let a single one escape. So the people seized them all, and Elijah took them down to the Kishon Valley and killed them there. May the Lord bless the reading of the Lord, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we love you today. Lord, I thank you so much for this scripture. I thank you so much for what you've done in my life, and what, you, what you've shown me this week, and reminded me, God, how much you're in control. God, I call upon you right now. Just as Elijah did. To rain the fire of the Holy Spirit in this place today, Lord. I pray, God, that you would speak today. And that your fire would come down among us, Lord. And we would be consumed by you in our life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Two things, two points today. I know it's a little different. But two points today is all we have. Number one, the fireless altar. We have two altars. You know, there are two altars mentioned in our text today. They're both called an altar, but they're different. They both look like, they both are the same, have the same purpose. They both have to be built so they can offer the sacrifice on it, but they had different results. The fireless altar was the one of Baal, but the flaming altar was the one of the Lord. So let's see as we, what happens in these. What happens in the fireless altar? What happens there? It brings indecisiveness. Brings indecisiveness. How much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions, Elijah said? Verse 21. It's not the decision is the altar there. It's not the decision of how we handle the service. It's not the decision of, it's not the decision of how what we sing and, or do this or that. It's the decision of life and death. That's what it is. That's what it is for us in our life today. And you know what? The enemy wants us to be indecisive. Wants us to know, I'm not sure whether I'm saved or not. I'm not sure whether I... Let me tell you, without a that shadow of doubt in my mind, don't would you ever doubt this old boy. I know where I'm going. I know where I am. That enemy can tell me over and over and over and over and over. He can whisper in my ear and discourage me over and over and over and over and over again. But you know what God reminds me every time? He cannot take my salvation. It ain't in him. It ain't in him. Is God real or are the made-up gods real and... And this includes idols in our lives and worship, 
we, we worship. Whatever it may be. Anything that takes the place of God, we know that's, work, that's, that's idols. That's idols. They become little gods in their lives. What did the fireless altar also have? It brings senseless sacrifices. Senseless. Why did that bull not have to die? Why did they have to cut that bull up in pieces and everything with nothing happened? Why? Because it was senseless. The sacrifice has to be prepared for the altar. Preparing the altar, the sacrifice, the prayer, the dancing, the shouting. It was, it was all for prophets of Baal did. But remember something. There's similarities in between the two altars. Both had to be prepared. Both had sacrifices that had to be prepared to place on them. Both had prayer that took place in the demonstrations. However, the fireless altar offered a sense of sacrifice. We see in verse 26 that there was no response to their prayers, their shouts, or their, or their praises. I want to share something with you that I read this week, and I thought, man, that's so cool. <clears throat> in a small town in America, a person decided to open up his bar business, which was right up opposite to a church. The church and its congregation started a campaign to block the bar from opening with petitions and prayed daily against his business. Work progressed. However, when it was almost complete, and he was about to open a few days later, a strong lightning struck the bar, struck the bar, and it was burnt to the ground. The church folk were rather smug in their outlook after that. To the bar owner sued the church authorities for $2 million on the grounds that the church, through its congregation and prayers, was ultimately responsible for the demise of his bar shop, either through direct or indirect actions or means. In its reply to the court, the church, now listen to what the church said, in its reply to the court, <clears throat> the church vehemently denied all responsibility or any connection that their prayers were reasons to the bar's demise. In support of their claim, they referred to the Benson study at Harvard that inter intercessionary prayer had no impact. Now, this is what the church says. This is a statement from the church. And this, in the case, as the case made its way into court, the judge looked over the paperwork and at the hearing and commented, I don't know how I'm going to decide this case, but it appears from the paperwork that we have a bar owner who believes in the power of prayer. And we have an entire church that is devoted, that, that an entire church and its devotees that does not. Go judge. Go judge. You know what? That's what happens in our society today, honestly. Let me tell you something. If they put a bar right here beside us, a club right here beside us, I'm going to be right outside talking to people when they come in and out. Let's go, man. Why? Why? They need Jesus, man. That's the reason why they open the club and they're going to the club. There's a reason why I used to go to the club. There's a reason why I used to drink and smoke pot and all those things and, and do drugs. There's a reason why I did. Because I was looking for something, man. I was looking for something. So instead of raising Cain about what they're building over there, how about let's beat the church and go beat the church? You know, that's amazing to me. Man, they prayed and the lightning come down and struck it. Now all of a sudden they don't want to take responsibility. I think the church should have stood up and said, hey, you doggone right you prayed that thing come down. We'll take whatever you want to give us, sir. But you know what? We didn't start the fire, so you can't actually sue us. You know? Unless you're in America, because they can sue for anything, can't you? Get some hot coffee. The fire, this altar, brings indecisiveness and it brings senseless sacrifices. That was a sense of sacrifice of that, that building when the church wouldn't stand up for it, right? For what went on. Lastly, brings disappointment. Brings disappointment. When Dale never showed up, it brought disappointment to the prophets of Baal. Following the false god and having nothing but cold, dry wood certainly brings disappointment. Can you imagine sitting there and you're cold and it's wintertime outside and you have nothing to heat with, but all you have is some cold, dry wood? You ain't got nothing to set on fire with, but you got wood there, but you're sitting there. It's not, there's not much to it, is it? You can't do anything with it. It's also, it also brings ridicule and personal sacrifices we see in verse 27 and 28. Notice how confident Elijah was. He scoffed at them, saying, you, you, You'll have to shout louder. Perhaps he's daydreaming or relieving himself, or maybe he's on a trip or asleep. Man, I love that part. That's my favorite part of this whole story. Because you know what it says? God's got a sense of humor. You know? God's got a sense of humor. He gave a sense of humor to Elijah. It shows personality there. It shows he wasn't just a machine. He wasn't just a robot. He wasn't just a He was actually a person. 
Can you imagine being surrounded by 449 of your closest friends and something you've worshipped your whole life or thought it was real your whole life turns out to be false or fake? Can you imagine that? There's one man standing in front of you. There's 450 of you, so there's 449 other people standing there with you who claim they believe in something that they find out is not real. Can you imagine that disappointment? Can you imagine that? Why don't you imagine it? It would be much like, you know, a child calling on their mom over and over and over again, over and over and over again, and your mom never comes to show it up. Just as much as the child would depend on their mom, they depended on their false God. They just knew it was real. No matter how loud we, we, we yell, no matter how hard we try to please a false God, He will always bring disappointment. When there's no fire in your altar, we've lost our spark, our zeal for really what's real. Second altar today, flaming altar. Flaming altar. It brings things too, but different. It brings restoration. It brings restoration. Man, I think that's a word in the church that's so lightly used today it's not important. Who can restore us? Only one. God is the only one that can restore us. You know, we tend to point out everybody else's sin because we sin differently than they do. You know that? Oh, uh, I, don't, I, I know so-and-so, they committed adultery. I know, man, look at this and that. They love to talk about it. I'm not going to talk about nobody, but... Let me tell you this. I don't mean to talk about nobody, but anytime somebody enters a conversation with that with you and everything, I've done it too. Anytime you're in a conversation and everything, just be like, wait for your butt. You know, there's something different coming. I'm not trying to talk about Shannon, but I'm going to tell you that girl's infatuated with saying, boy, I'm going to tell you right now this. So I talked about it, right? But I didn't mean to, right? You know what? So many times we do the same thing. We, that's a sin, is it not? To gossip. It's my outline in the Bible. I'll never forget an a elder in the church down the road from us. I won't tell you which one it was, but I thought it was so funny. He shared with me one day. He dipped the back of it. And he had it in his middle lip and everything and all. And said, somebody in the church came up to him and said, Hey, if you dip it the back of it, that's a sin. That's not a good example. You're sitting as an elder and all, blah, 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 blah. He said, Man, he said, Can I ask you a question? Does it even talk about the back of the Bible? She said, No. He said, But it talks about gluttony. And he just looked at her. She was very overweight. And I thought, oh, man, you kind of crawl right there. But the truth of the matter is this. Just because she thinks that's a sin, and even if it is a sin, that's between him and God, because nowhere in the Bible does it say anything about tobacco. And tobacco money probably built this church. <laughs> and I guarantee you the people that were here at that time when this church was built didn't say, oh, no, we don't want you money from tobacco. It's much like the ones today that are so against the lottery. Oh, I'm so against the lottery. I'm so against, I'm against people who are abusing it and being addicted to it and throwing away their money when they should be spending it on their families. The Bible says don't take food off your own table and go gamble it away with something else. You need to make sure that everything's all taken care of at home. But everybody's preaching so much against that because that's such a sin, that's such a sin, that's such a sin. But how many churches do you know that have taken up sold raffle tickets to buy a chance to win something, to win a quill? You're buying a raffle ticket for a chance to win a quill. What's the difference? There is none. There is none. There's no difference. You're, you're, you're paying it for a chance to win something. And I guarantee you, I know I would, if Valerie goes tomorrow and she wins the lottery, it's $30 million, she, she ties on it, I'm certainly going to tell you, yes, sir, this church will be great. Yes, ah. We won't be built on those water cisterns no more. Praise God. I don't know any pastor out there who wouldn't take it. But they're preaching it. I'm not bashing that. I want you to understand that. I'm not promoting the lottery. I'm saying that so we understand something. When people accuse other people because they sin, they need to look in the mirror and understand we sin too. That doesn't make it right. And that doesn't make it right if we live in that sin. There's a big difference in struggling with sin and living in it. Amen? Amen? When we sin differently than others, we have a tendency to judge their sin because we sin differently than they do. Right? We've got to understand something. No matter how far somebody's gone, we serve a restoring God. How do we know that from this scripture? What was the altar? What did it say he did to the altar? What did it say Elijah did to his altar? He had to do what first? You remember? Re rebuild it, repair it. He had to repair it, right? Doesn't tell us who tore it down or where it was at. You can go search out and search over and over and over trying to find out where it was at and everything. It doesn't say that. Here's the point of the matter, though. He had to rebuild it. And he took the 12 stones to represent what? The 12 tribes of Israel, right? And so he paid homage to God, but God restored that altar. I submit something to you this morning is this. I think God needs to restore our altar in our church and in our home. 
in our church and in our home. Boy, I was studying this this week. I said, man, I'll take it out. And I still feel you. I know. I get to bed at night, lay down, and want to pray by myself and everything, fall right asleep. Wake up and start praying again. I'll go by myself, all somewhere by myself, and dunk donuts in the corner. Be studying your word, God, and somebody just call my phone to ring left and right, and then I start getting distracted by that. Forgive me, Father. Restore me. Restore my altar. Restore wherever it's at. Get on my side of my bed on my face. Get, get, get on my knees before you, God, to show that you are God. I bow before you out of reverence to you. You're God. I believe God needs to restore our altars. He needs to restore our altars, just like he did here. This is a perfect example of our one true God. We get damaged all the time, amen? Amen? How many get damaged? How many come in broken? How many get jacked up sometimes? We're, we're jacked up, we come in broken. We serve a God who fixes it. Amen? Flaming altar brings restoration from the restored Father. It also brings real faith and sacrifice brings real faith to sacrifice. Elijah didn't just prepare the altar and, and the bull for sacrifice. He drenched it with water and still believed that he had, and still believed and had faith that God was greater than Baal. Elijah's bull was the real sacrifice that God provided just as Jesus is the real sacrifice that God provided for me and you. Except Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. The ultimate sacrifice. Remember this altar was not prepared was, was not prepared much differently than the, than the altar of the prophets of Baal. It was prepared the same, the sacrifice was the same, the material was the same. However, there's a huge difference. And no, my friend, it wasn't the water. Yes, that was different. The difference is the presence of God, the real God. That's the difference. There's a huge difference, my friend, in walking with him than walking without him. Does that mean we're perfect? No. Nope. That means we've got to have the faith that he is who he says he is. And sometimes it's a sacrifice for us. Sometimes we have to make those sacrifices. I, I want to tell you, I'm, I know I say it a lot, but I want to tell you there's a, there's a big difference that, that God showed me yesterday too. Elijah called on Daddy. And Daddy always shows up at his kids' events when they ask him to. You know that? All you got to do is ask him. He'll show up. God confirmed it again yesterday in me. He said, hey, it's competition, I win. He asked me to go. He said, hey, and I, I was really work wondering. He, I didn't think he wanted me to go. And then, then he wanted me to go, and, and, and I was like, okay. Well, I went, and me and, me and Chris went in. We had a great time together. She and I had some time to talk and things, too, while he did his little thing. Then also, when I get the, the text from Jessica, and I talked to Mr. Buck and find out that Miss Carol passed, I, I thought, man, the pastor says, you got to go, dude. you got to go. And then the daddy says, you're a daddy, dude. you got to be his pastor before you can be somebody else's pastor. Too many years of that, buddy. Too many years. And I texted their deacons and told them. I felt like I had to explain to them why I wasn't going and why I wasn't being the pastor at that point. Then all of a sudden I realized that the text doesn't show emotion. And I texted them back and I said, I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to say, guys, you do this or you do that or I'm not doing this. I just wanted to know confirmation that I'm doing the right thing and staying with my son instead of running and going. I'm torn. That's my son. That's my baby. And I'm torn. And I know I want to go do what you told me to do, God, but I want to do this right now, too, and be with him. God, show me. And I got a text back that says, do you want me to go? I'm cutting grass right now, but I'll be glad to go if you, unless you want to go when you get back and call me when you get back. Another one says, I can go. And then when I received the text, I said, hey, you're doing what you're supposed to do. you got to be your son's pastor first. And all I could hear was that in my mind, because I just said it to myself. You know, our God is awesome. And all I could think about this morning when I was in my office praying is how Elijah called his daddy, and his daddy showed up. I don't know about you, but my daddy was not in my life growing up. He bounced in and out here and there and all. Never had that relationship. Wanted a daddy for a long, long, long time. Prayed, asked God to bring me a daddy. And in, in, two, 20, in 2000, January 2000, when I, when I surrendered my life to him, I got the real daddy. Oh, he blessed me with Larry as a daddy on this earth and, and, and Shorty as a daddy on this earth. He blessed me with that. But you know what? 
They're going to leave and they're going to fail me at times. I'm going to leave and fail him at times. You know that? But he'll never leave me. He showed me who the real daddy was. And he showed me when I call on him, he shows up. And I thought yesterday for the first time, first time, thank you leaders. I love you, man. I'm so thankful for you. Thank you for standing and reminding me of what I'm supposed to be. And thank you for allowing me to be accountable to you and you be accountable to me. Because God works, man. He does. He called on Daddy because he had faith that Daddy is who he said he is. He sacrificed himself to say, hey, I'm believing. Now understand something. He just watched 450 people call on their God over and over. This is 400. You got this with me? 450 people. He's called. They're calling. All of them shouting, praying. Woo, that's a, can you imagine that church? Can you imagine that church is shouting and praying and everything, and all of a sudden they look over and there's one. We know one's important, right? Yeah. Who's your one ain't stopped unless you stop it. Amen. I hope you're still praying for your one. I hope you're still reaching out to your one. I take some text mine and talk all of them this week. God's going to do something, and I believe it. Eventually, it's going to happen. In God's time, it might take like it did with me and Crystal to understand it. It might take 11 years for my silly tale to understand it. But I'm going I'm to understand it one day. One person took a stand. One person facing 450 people in front of him who claimed to be that they got it. Who got all these followers following them. Okay? And the king is on their side. Man, what a sacrifice he had to make by stepping up, right? I'm going to go into battle. <laughs> and I don't have nothing but Jesus. You know what it tells me? I don't care if you're one or a thousand in this church. It will make a difference. One is important and one can make a difference. Amen? Amen? Lastly. Flaming altar. Brings proof and justice. Proof and justice. Proof that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the real deal. The flaming altar shows us that the consuming love of God, just like the fire consuming all the fire, all the sacrifice, the wood and all the water, well, nothing left. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Pour it three times, man. I know my God's bigger than that. I know my God's bigger. Pour water on three times. Keep on going. Keep on going. Pull it off. Pour it all in there. Let it soak up in those stretches. I know my daddy. He gonna, he gonna, he's gonna send the fire down to take that sacrifice. Ooh, little, little did he know that he's going to send it down to take the whole thing. <laughs> to take the whole thing. I want to say something to us as a church. You think those people knew who God was then? This is what God told me this morning. People are watching us too. And when situations come up that we face in the wall and a battle, they're watching they're watching. I don't know about you, but I failed so many times, man. I've handled it so wrong, man. And people are watching. And I believe that I didn't lead people to Jesus in that. I believe I'll stand accountable for that one day. But I'll tell you what it said to me this morning, too. I got a story. I don't know about you. I got a good story that Jesus done in my life and is still doing. I got a testimony. Because I had an encounter with the Savior. Changed my life forever. You know what? Elijah stepped up and called on his daddy. And when his daddy showed up, everybody sees it. Does everybody see it in us? Or are we really calling on daddy? Because he's proved and real. Our God is a consuming God. The flaming altar brings proof, but also justice. Justice for the false prophets that did their best to point others away from the real God. Those that steer people away from the real God will suffer one day the same way that these did at Old Testament. That's what we need to understand. And my friends, if we're not pointing people to Jesus, we're pointing them, we're leading them away from him. That's the, that's the bottom line. Because Stone Cold says so. Okay? In case y'all didn't notice in that video, some of you young people don't have no idea. He said, I'm Mr. Drummond. He said, what you talking about? Y'all didn't see, so those of us that know, those back in the day, different strokes, okay, Mr. Drummond, Willis would look at him and be like, what you talking about, Mr. Drummond? That's so funny in there. Y'all didn't even get that healthy when we got. 
We got it better than y'all anyway, isn't it? Some people got it. Those that steer people away from the real God, they will suffer one day. The same fate as these in the Old Testament. These false prophets suffered earthly death. And they'll suffer eternal damnation when cast into the lake of fire forever in the great white throne judgment. We talked about it the other week, man. It's two deaths. It's two deaths. Took them down to the Kishon Valley. We've been there. I've been there. Huge. Huge. Standing up at Mount Precipice, just looking around, looking down. On one side. Then the other side, where's this where the battle of Armageddon is going to take place? Which never represents death. Destruction. And they took them down and they, they, and they killed them because justice prevailed. So that they couldn't lead somebody else away from the real God. But you know what, my friends? They're going to be called at the Great White Throne Judgment and they're going to be cast right into the lake of fire. And they're going to see what we actually have. <laughs> that are saved. As the praise man comes, I want to tell you this one. There are two altars. There's two altars. There's two altars in Scripture. There's two altars in the world today. The fireless altar that brings no hope. And the flaming altar that brings all hope. As you stand to your feet this morning, I want to tell you this. Our God is a real deal. He's proved it many times. He's proved it. Our God didn't just halfway show up with Elijah called upon him. He didn't just send down the fire. He consumed it all, church. God doesn't want our occasional pop in and out of church. He doesn't want our occasional Bible reading. He doesn't want our occasional prayer, nor just our hearts. God wants to do in our lives just what he did at this altar call. We have an altar call every Sunday. You call it, I call it ministry time. Old school called it altar call. This was altar call. They built the altar and came to an altar to sacrifice. And believed that God was going to prevail. Believed that God was going to do something. He wants to fully consume our lives. To be fully consumed, we have to be on fire for the Lord. Amen? Amen? Y'all, okay, we're going to keep going here, okay? So I give it to you, all right? I want you to be with me. His fire is to be in us. He doesn't want us to be warm. Yes, I know he'd rather us be hot or cold. But I don't believe that anything inside me that God wants me to be cold or lukewarm. I believe inside me God wants me to be hot and on fire for him. He wants to set that fire. We talked about a revival. Pastor Robert brought that. I know that I can't be consumed by him when I'm cold or just lukewarm. He wants me to be on fire for him. He wants you to be on fire for him. So my question for us today how hot your wood? How hot is your wood? Is it dried up? Is it cold? Is it, is it just lukewarm? Or are you really on fire? Because I want to say this morning, God told me to tell you this week, whoever this is for, he wants to consume you. He wants all of you. He wants your sacrifice. He wants everything you got for him and for his glory. And I promise you, with everything I have, it is worth the battle. It is worth the fight. I don't care if you're facing 450 false prophets of Baal. It is worth the fight. Stay in it. Everybody can run. Everybody can tuck their tail and leave. Stay in it. Elijah didn't run. Not yet. He walked in front of 450. And I don't know any of us in here who have ever gone to battle with 450 other people right straight in front of us and we got to go to it just by ourselves and think, oh, we got to call God. But he did. To prove that our God is real. Our God is awesome. Do you believe God's really real? Do you believe God can do anything? If you do, call on Him to bring it. Bring it, God. Bring it. Bring it on. Bring the fire in my life. Fill me up. Ask Him to consume your life. Consume your life with purifying fire. You know what? When He burned all that stuff up and all that stuff was taken, there was nothing there. It was clean. Because fire purifies. I ask you today, how hot she would. The altar's already built. The altar's already built. The sacrifice has already been made. He's waiting on us as a church to be who he called us to be. To be on fire, to be consumed by him. Fully consumed. The enemy seeks to destroy us and kill us and steal from us. Do you understand that? I don't know about you, I've let him steal my joy way too many times. I've let him knock me down way too many times. 
almost let him heal me. But my God prevails. He wants to consume my life and he wants to consume your life. He wants to be everything or nothing. There's no in between now. You can't, can't waver. You can't, can't hobble between them. He either is or he ain't. Teenagers. You're listening back there, you talk. I love you. But you don't give.
still praying at the altar, please bow your heads with me real quick. Everybody's head bowed and eyes closed. Nobody looking around. Everybody's head bowed and eyes closed. Even the worship team. If you can play with your eyes closed. I don't want anybody looking. I just want to ask you, I want to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. I want to ask you this morning. If you leave here today and death takes your picture, if you don't know where you'd be, would you slip your hand up right back there? I'm not sure I'd go to heaven, Pastor. I'm not sure I'd be there. I'm not sure of my salvation. I'm not sure. Would you slip your hand up right back down here, Bobby? God bless you. God sees that hand. All heads bowed and eyes closed. Anyone else? I want to pray for you, and I just want you to know I want to pray for you, and I'm not just saying that. I believe God is, I know he's working. I know he's working. I know he's working in my life. Maybe you're here this morning and you're struggling with something. All heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You know you got a struggle. you got a battle you've been facing. And the Lord showed you this morning that that battle's not too big for him. If you would, just lift your hand up right by now. Anybody? God bless you. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise your holy name, God. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy. Thank you, Jesus. You're worthy. Thank you, Lord. You take the battle. Thank you, God, that you're powerful. Thank you, God, that you are almighty. Thank you, God, for being with your children when they call you daddy. Thank you, God, for showing up. God, I lift up those this morning may lift in their hands, Lord, who don't know, Lord. I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would be with them. I pray that you would lead them and guide them, Lord. I pray that you would let your Holy Spirit come in their hearts. And Lord, let someone show them, Lord, in Scripture. May they come to me or someone else in the church, Lord, whoever it is, that we may show them in God's word, your word, God, how they can be saved, Lord. How they can know, God, thank you so much. I praise your holy name to know that I'm saved. Thank you for my salvation. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus the perfect sacrifice to take my place for a debt that he didn't owe and a debt I can't never pay. Thank you for your power. God, you give it to us. You told us in your word we'll do greater things than even Jesus did. Lord, we just don't even believe it. Help us to stand true and believe. Help us to have the faith that, God, there's nothing impossible with you truly. Help us to understand you have overcome death, hell, and the grave. There's nothing else for you to overcome. You've overcome it all. Father, I thank you for your spirit in this place this morning. I pray, God, right now over our, our, our fall festival, Lord, I pray that you would move in a mighty way. Lord, I pray that, Lord, we would see souls saved from it. Lord, we would just be doing it to do it. We'd be doing it so we share the gospel so that people could see you in our lives. That we're different. And want the same thing we got salvation for eternity with you in heaven. Perfect place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love you. Shake someone's hand in fellowship this morning.